Hello world, and welcome to the Innovation Coaching Podcast. My name is Klaus Rostel, and with me today, I have Noah Deckel. Noah, tell me how I can help. Hi there, I'm Noah. I would love to know how we can use, I suppose, strategy in a way to really push innovation in a meaningful way, and not just in a cool way. I like that. That's a pretty broad ask, right? I, I mean, I can, I can, of course, walk through that. Give me a little bit more specifics. Give me a little bit more. What, do, what does it look like? What context do we have here? What are we trying to do? I can also, of course, go completely nuts just on the general and, and talk away for hours. But let's let's make it a bit more specific. But I like the broad thinking to start with. Perfect. I suppose there are so many tools out there and there are so many really exciting, I think, things that are that are sort of launched and that we use. My question, I guess, is how do you do it in a way that that you use it, for example, in a way to really make your your world, your work, your everyday you know, better, more optimized? Um, how do you use it strategically? How do you sort of um, implement all this innovation in a way that really kind of makes your your day better, your world better? Mm, I like that. And are we talking from an organization standpoint or like a small company or are we talking just a person or, or where, where are we in that? There are, there are some tactics and some strategies that work better with a team. If I say, oh, you should create a, a skunk works, they're like, you're like, what, what is that? And I'm one person I don't know. Do I like separate my foot from the rest of the body and let it do experiments? <laughs> like that, that works less well if you're just one person. Where are we on scale here? I'm always intrigued, I think, in small organizations, just because I think they got to be a little bit more creative, uh, given the fact that they don't have a whole lot of budget and a whole lot, you know, to spend on it. But also, whatever you feel kind of intuitively is your space and you feel like you actually have good examples or, or insights, I'd love to hear it. Ah, I like that. So so just to set the stage here, we're not necessarily talking about a specific problem that you bring, which is nice and which is what I normally do, but you're more giving me license to just go off the reservation. And, uh, and I like that. I'm going to totally take advantage of that. And then if something pops that you think, huh, I want to know more about this because this is something I'm struggling with. We'll go there. I like that. Thanks for that, that alibi to just talk. That is very much appreciated. So first off, I'd say that there are a couple of things here that are tricky, and that is what do the words actually mean? The first one is innovation. Innovation is, in my experience, it's just a fancy word for change. Mm -hmm. We have situation A, and we'd like not to have situation B. Mm -hmm. And situation B is worse than situation A, right? So we're doing well, or we're we're on the diet or we're raising the kid or we're running the company and things are not going as well as we'd like them to, or else we'd just be happy. Or maybe they're going fine. We'd just like them to be better. Mm -hmm. And what we want to avoid is for them to be worse. And most people don't start innovating until they realize if they do nothing, it's going to get worse. And this is one of the most important things I find to understand in innovation is that innovation happens in two places and more or less only in two places. It happens when we get desperate, when we realize if I don't do something different, this is not going to be the same tomorrow. It's going to be worse tomorrow. Or it's already so bad that it's going to be the same tomorrow. If you're in a football match, right? We just had the European finals of the European football tournament and the UEFA Euros. And if you're behind 4-0, You've just started the second half and it's the finals. Then probably nobody in that locker room is going to say, hey, coach, if we keep doing what we're doing, they won't score any goals. Like, that's great. Good input, number four. <laughs> but we're behind 4-0. And that means we cannot afford to stay where we are because things are already bad. Mm -hmm. That's when things tend to pop up, right? So when we're desperate, the other place where things pop up is when we feel invulnerable, when we've got enough, mm -hmm. when we feel safe, when it's it's the other locker room and they say, hey, coach, we're ahead four to zero. 
could we try a new tactic? There's a much better chance the coach is going to say, sure, it's four to zero. Let's try something new. Let's swap the wings or let's uh, play with a uh, fake number nine or whatever football-y stuff we want to do. Mm -hmm. That's also doable. Where if it's a one to zero lead and it's a hard fought match, then it's very, very rare you get somebody say, let's try something completely new yeah. because then it's too close to take chances, mm -hmm. right? That's the feeling normally. And this, this mindset of, or this understanding that innovation happens at the edges. Mm -hmm. I call it in, in my framework, I call it challenging routines that you need to look up for a moment and say, hey, if we keep doing this, will it get worse? Then maybe it's time to act now. Or if we do we have enough that we can actually take some chances? Yes, we're doing great. Are we doing great enough that we can afford to fail? Mm -hmm. And I remember saying that at one of our own events, the College of Extraordinary Experiences, a couple of years back. It's a yearly event that gathers people from all over the world. And we had, like so many other events, we had a bar. And the bar was very popular and we had great uh, kind of mixologists in the bar and it was lovely, but it also meant that evenings would tend to go on until three, four, five every night and some people would be smashed the day after. And we discussed in our organizing team and our, our partner team, we discussed, what if we did it non-alcoholic? One of the others suggested, said, what if we did it non-alcoholic as a default? Yes, people can still grab a glass of red wine in their room, but what if we change the default to non-alcoholic? And I said, I'm not sure that's a good idea, but I am sure that our event is successful enough that even if it doesn't work out, we can afford to try it. Mm -hmm. So even if it turned out that this was not really a good idea, then it wouldn't cost us too much to try it. So we did it. Mm -hmm. And it turned out it was a really good idea. It was a really, really good idea, both for ourselves and for our participants. And we had participants saying, wow, I can't imagine how crazy this would be if there was alcohol. And we said, well, there used to be. And they said, "Woo, okay, it's crazy enough. I'm so glad you guys don't have alcohol as well, because this is already enough of a roller coaster emotional journey. This is already enough of a crazy event. Mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it was a good thing to do. And I, I don't think we're going to switch back anytime soon, if at all. But I know that the reason we made that jump, that experiment, was because Paul said, hey, let's try this. Phil said, I agree. And I said, you know what? I'm not sure I agree. I'm not sure it's a good idea, but I'm sure we can afford to take the chance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's when you feel you have enough, right? That's when you feel you're doing well enough that you can take chances. That's when innovation happens. And the other place it happens is when you're doing so badly that you're willing to take any sort of chance because you can see doing more of the same is not going to help, is not going to solve the problem or fix it, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. That I find is the most core understanding of innovation. Does that help a little? Absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, so many times, you know, founders or, you know, CMOs, directors of marketing are, they realize that they should be integrating uh, more innovation, experimenting a little bit more, having that sort of open mindset. What would you say, you know, if if there was some sort of a checklist to first see if you're even ready for this, if you've got the right people, the right resource, and then how would you go about sort of, you know, integrating more innovation? What would you do? What kind of action plan would you kind of suggest? So, I would start with this, and, and I like to have very simple, almost stupid, banal solutions to problems that are reasonably complex, right? One of the things I've been talking a little bit about recently in the world of event design, where I've spent uh, more than a quarter of the decade, or of a decade, more than a quarter of a century, actually, not a wow. quarter of a decade. That's a, <laughs> it's, it's worse. It's not two and a half years. It's more than 25 years in events. That's impressive. So I know a thing or two about events. And one of the things I often say there to anyone who wants to listen and, and a lot who don't is if you want people to talk, start by turning down the music, mm -hmm. right? Super simple, super banal, super almost stupid. And yet so many don't do it. Yeah. And when it comes to innovation, I tend to start in the same places. And the first one, the reason I mentioned this desperation versus, versus kind of having enough being ready to take chances is that many people 
don't know where they are on that scale. If you ask people, it's one of the questions I often ask is, we're on, are you on that scale? Are you ready to take chances? What would happen if you failed? And then either they'll say, oh, it's okay if we fail because we're failing already. Good. You're ready to innovate. You're just, right now, you have the will. You're just lacking the ideas or the skill. It's not the will that's lacking. If they say, ha, huh, if we fail, no problem. We'll just try something else. We're doing great. Then you have the will. Maybe you also have the skill. Maybe you have the, the you also have the resources, probably. You're just looking for the idea. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. If you say, oh, we love to innovate, but just not right now. How about in the next quarter? Or how about later? Or, oh, not right now. We're busy. Then you know that's the problem. Then it's not about a good idea or the right people. Then it's about they're in stuck in that middle, which is terrifying, but which is where most of us live most of our lives, where we know we should change. We know we want to change. We're open to change. Just not right now. Yes. <laughs> just not, oh, can you can you do? And I get this so much as somebody who's I've, I've gotten to the point in my career where I'm lucky enough that there are plenty of people who say, hey, Klaus, you seem to be a guy with experience and ideas and maybe a bit of skill. And you're reasonably good at thinking outside the box. We love your help. And I'm, I'm really privileged to be in that position. And I, I really enjoy that. What I find most hilarious is how many of them say, we want help. And then I say, great. When do you want help? Oh, not right now. Or, okay, here's an idea for help that's going to be very simple. It's going to be free. It's just going to require you to take a chance. Oh, we can't do that. Mm. Okay, why? Well, we're busy. Or what if it failed? Or what if? And that means if you know, if you get that answer, then the answer is not better ideas. The answer is not bring in more skilled people or make it cheaper. The answer is the mindset. And that is so classic. And you'll find that, and I'm sure you already find that both with yourself and others, is that you can pretty fast identify, is there a problem that they are not yet ready to innovate rather than what it's about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Have you also found that it's also a matter of maybe a chicken and egg scenario where they go when we're big enough or when we've got that? Yes. And you go, well, actually, that could actually help us <laughs> to achieve that goal. Yes, yes. And it's crazy. And I, I watch because I'm, I'm a, I've been in startups in many years. I'm a startup founder. I'm multi-founder, yada, yada, serial founder, I think it's called. And I also advise startups and have been part of like startup training programs. And I've, I've taught at startup training programs for many years. So I get to do a lot of startup related stuff. And I also watch startup programs on TV. And one of them, Danish one, there are these like Shark Tank, Dragon's Den, that sort of thing. There's a Danish version, which is called The Lion's Den. And in that, they have a, a spin-off series that's called The Lion's Den, Welcome to Reality. So you see and you see them coming to, in The Lion's Den, they come and they do pitches for investors. And they say, I have an idea that we should all do, have recycled underwear made from seaweed. And then the investors say, bravo, bravo, great mission, great thing. Here, have my money and you'll get my help. That's the basic program. The, the spinoff program, Welcome to Reality, is, okay, what happens after they get the investment? Yeah. Where the TV crew follows some of these, these investors and you get their stories and you get to, to their challenges. And to me, that's super interesting. And one of the things that's the most interesting is how many of them, they go through a, a kind of phases that look like this. One. I have an idea, I get the investors, woohoo, then else they wouldn't be in the program. Two, they get the investors, they set ambitious goals, the investors say, maybe they're a bit too ambitious, but they also need to learn and maybe it just might work and they're onto something. And then they say, yes, it's gonna be great. And then they realize, oh, it's gonna be hard. And then they get to a point where they either almost break or it gets better and then they start selling and suddenly it explodes for the ones that the, the TV show covers are usually the ones where it goes reasonably well with an odd like number of, oh, this failed completely just for just for a kind of variety. So most of them go through this journey of, oh, it was hard. Oh, now we found out how to do it. And then they just explode and, and business is growing like crazy. They hit the right spot. And then what happens? This is where it gets really interesting. This is why I did this long lead up to this point is then a lot of them have the same experience. And that is, 
it's going so well that they're growing like wildfire. They're working 18 hour days, but they can't take a break because if they did so, the growth would stop and they can't hire somebody to help because there's not enough money to hire anybody yet. So they don't have enough, right? So they're, they don't need to innovate. They just need to do, except they, it's killing them to do because the speed they need to do stuff at, they need to both do the marketing, the bookkeeping and packing the things and sending it out the customers and blah, 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 blah. they need to do it all. And yet they've structured the business in a way. So even though they're hugely successful at this point, they're growing like crazy. They can't keep up because it's going so fast that they don't have the resources to hire somebody to help them and to train and to, to kind of, to delegate. And it's a complete chicken and egg thing. So they're saying, oh, I'm right now so stressed out. And some of them really are like close to breaking from a, from a really terrible human standpoint that from success, they're close to breaking. And they keep saying, if I only had the egg, I could get more chickens. Mm -hmm. Or if I only had another chicken, I could get more eggs, right? They're at that point where they're, they're ready to get, delegate, but they don't have the money or the time to do that. And that means that they're stuck because they are kind of they're they're the the clog in the system. They're the bottleneck. Mm -hmm. And I find that that is oh that is saddening, but it's also very very real. This chicken and egg thing. And I find the answer to that once you've accepted this, where innovation happens, the answer is create structures so that if it works, it doesn't just work a little bit. It works a lot. Mm. And I'll give you an example, and then I'll, I'll I'll shut up and give you some space to to react. Is my old company, which crashed five years ago, left me in massive debt. That when we were when we were growing explosively, right, growing from five people to forty seven over the course of a couple of years, we looked at some of our events and saw that if we sold out every single ticket to this event, and people were paid badly, we were all paid incredibly badly at that time. Me as well. Then we would, if we sold all of it, then there would be a little bit of money left over, right? If we were super successful, there would be a little bit money left over. And it's a little bit like saying, hey, I'd like to do a speaker business and I charge uh, uh, 500 pounds per speak, which is very nice, right? You get 500 pounds to, to talk somewhere. And then, so if I have 20 of them, in a month, then I'm speaking basically every day, and I now have 10,000 pounds, which is pretty nice, pretty decent. But if your costs of living, the money you need to earn to like support your family and the lifestyle you have, whatever that is, is that you need to earn like 9,000 just to cover that, then even when you're most successful, if you're booked for 20 speaking gigs in a month, then you're just barely surviving. Well, then maybe the problem is that you need to not charge 500 per talk. You need to maybe charge a thousand or two or five, because even though it's going to be harder, you don't want to get into a suggestion where success will actually exhaust you and burn you out. And I see so many startup founders doing that. And that chicken and egg problem, it's right there, right? Make sure that the first chicken is a fat one. So when it produces eggs, <laughs> if you can get it to lay eggs, then there'll be enough eggs that you can get some more chickens. Do you think that it's also a matter of a personality of the founder? What, you know, from your perspective, what have you sort of seen when you analyze successful ones, the successful businesses? Do they have something in common? Do you see some sort of a pattern in the way that they address these issues, the way that they onboard innovation? What what have you been seeing? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, of course. And really good question. One of the things I find is that a, a growth mindset is necessary mm -hmm. because there's just like with kids, right? I, when I became a father, I likened becoming a father to having a company. It's very different experiences, but they do have one thing in common. The moment you think you know what you're doing, it changes. Yes. And that means, oh, I now know how to have a one-year-old. Great. I'm a good dad to a one-year-old. Oops, it's no longer a one-year-old. It's now a two-year-old. And the rules have completely changed. Nice. And now Saga's six. And now wow. things that were useful when she was two are not that useful anymore. And things she liked when she was two or even five or even last week are not that useful anymore. And that means you need to constantly adapt, constantly change. And that is... In business, a lot of the time, especially for a startup, it's the same, right? Once you're running Coca-Cola, 
Yes, it doesn't change on a day-by-day -day basis, but you still need to be adaptable. So that's number one, is that growth mindset. If you think, oh, I can't do it and I can't learn because I can't do it, then it's going to be, it's going to be tough. Mm -hmm. Number two is you need to take that growth mindset seriously and not just say I'm willing to learn new stuff, but also I'm willing to believe that I will learn new stuff, which is a little bit different because what I find, and, and I've been through this myself painfully, that most successful creators of companies and especially growers of companies, whether they're small or big, they are in a situation and then for one reason or the other, they need to get to change that situation to something better. And then of course they have a goal, right? Oh, we have five customers, we'd like 10. Okay, that's cool. That's a reasonable goal. If you have five, maybe you can get 10. But somewhere down the line, if you want to keep growing, if you want to be a little bit bigger, if you don't want just to be a small thing, which shouldn't be good, then if you want to get to 100 and you have five, then you don't need to get from five to 100 today, but you need to do that someday. Mm -hmm. So you cannot create a system where no matter how well it works, you won't get past that 10. Again, that, that chicken and the egg situation. And that means you need to trust that you don't need to know everything today or you'll never get started, but you need to trust in yourself that, okay, I'll probably figure this out as I go along, right? When Saga becomes a teenager, I'm sure we'll have all sorts of different issues than we have now that she's six and we don't know how to handle them. We don't know what they'll be. We, are, we hope they'll come because the alternative is not very pleasing, but we're not super worried about it right now. Yes. And in a company, if you're trying to go somewhere, then you're gonna you're gonna get to that phase. You're gonna either you're not going to because it crashed and burned, and then you learn, and then maybe you do something else with your life or you try again, or you get there, but you don't need to do something, you don't need to know it all right away, and it doesn't need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. Most of the startup founders I know that are super successful are the ones who have learned, either they do it naturally, which is rare, or they have learned the hard way to get moving and leave their perfectionism by the door. One of my superpowers is I'm not a perfectionist. And the people I know who are perfectionists who've been very successful, almost all of them, not all, some have been so good that they've just managed. But most of them have gotten to a point where they've had to deal with their perfectionism. They've had to accept that there was a deadline or there was an opportunity or there was something where it was you have to push through that perfectionism and just launch or just do or just try whether it's making the LinkedIn post or it's launching the product or it's making the investment or doing the marketing campaign, whatever it is, you have to just say, now we press the button. You have to have a trigger finger. If you're not willing to shoot, it's very hard to hit. And if you're making sure you have to, you, you aim first and the aim is perfect, then usually the target is gone. Yes. Whatever that aiming may look like. So trigger finger, growth mindset, trigger finger. Love it. Those two, if you've got that, you, you've got pretty good chances. Yes. Uh, we use, When I worked at Meta, we had posters around the office that said, done is better than perfect. Mm -hmm. Which is very true. You know, the they say the Japanese, they take it to the 70% and they're, you know, and, and, and that's where it's really tricky. That last 30 where the most of the world is happy with just 70, the Japanese could take years and years and R and D and investment to get to that perfect hundred. But then by then the technology is already changed and they're a little bit left behind. So I do agree that sometimes you just have to really ship and, um, and move on because you can definitely get stuck. I was wondering if you had any any examples of sort of a nice sort of case study or a brand or a person or an example where you said, actually, that was really meaningful to me. I took a really interesting lesson from that. Yes, yes, I have one. These were some guys I met very recently in New York. I was there for the World Experience Summit, talking to experienced designers from all over the world. And one of the evenings, the organizers took us to a local dead letter warehouse. And you might be thinking, what's a dead letter warehouse? Well, a dead letter warehouse is what these guys created. Mm -hmm. And it started with, and I'll walk you through their journey because that really spoke to me and, and was, was something I think everybody should have heard of their journey. Because though it's simple, it is incredibly useful for all of us, including myself. 
there were these two guys and they had a background in theater and they wanted to do immersive theater, like theater where you're, you're not just watching, you're immersed in the theater. You're walking around in the sets, there's actors, blah, blah, blah. And they thought, let's do that and let's rent a location. They found this warehouse that used to be used for dead letters, like places where if the recipient isn't at home or the address is unknown, they'd end up in the US postal system, they'd end up in these dead letter warehouses. So that was the past of the building. It wasn't used for that anymore, because but that was the past of the building. They rented that, they refurbished it, and they made it into this immersive theater space. So people would buy tickets to a show and they would come in and they had this idea that, that they would facilitate conversations. So you would come in, you would buy a show, which was an hour or something like that, pay your money, I think it was $30. And then there would be a facilitator, like a trained actor who would draw out interesting conversations between strangers. And their, their basis were this, were these dead letters that were around the place so you could read them, all this sort of uh, thematic of circus. And they found that most people didn't get it. They found that about half the people they said, or maybe 30, 40% of them really didn't understand what the hell is going on. And they had trouble and they had trouble paying the bills. They had trouble selling the tickets and, and they didn't really, oh, what are we doing? And then they tried again. And then they, they tried changing the concept a bit. They made for a stronger story and they if I remember correctly, they made the, the show shorter and they made it more clear that it wasn't so much a theater show, though they came from theater and they thought of it as shows, but it was conversations. And they did some changes to the story and made it clear what was going on. And it still didn't work that well. And they yes, it worked a little bit better, but it was still tricky. And then there was the things happened and they they ran out of money and they were at a point they told us this story backstage and I'm, I'm sure i'm not telling it completely right but i'm telling it well enough that it works as a story and they said they got into a point where they needed to either close down and they spent a ton of money on this and they had investors they needed to either close down or do something radical and they decided to reopen and i think it was march of last year maybe it was even march of this year I'm not even sure. I think maybe even March of this year, March of 2024. And they would open in March because then there was, it was warm enough. They didn't need to spend money on heating and cold enough that people would still go inside. So they kind of, they, they, they timed it so they could maximize their chances and they got rid of all their actors mm -hmm. and they got rid of their whole big show idea. Instead, they said, let's have free entrance and let's just put these dead letters in different rooms. They built these beautiful rooms, these very thematic spaces like nostalgic America, the porch and the, the camper van and the campsite, that sort of thing. And then they didn't have music there, but they had like ambient sounds. So you could hear crickets and that sort of thing. So it felt like you were you're inside, but you're sitting at what looks like an American front porch from the 1950s with weird props. And then they have these letters and they print out a lot of these dead letters which were basically conversation starters. So it said you pick up a letter and it's not a real dead letter. It just says, what makes you lie? Or how do you feel about friendship? Or what is love to you? Like these rather deep questions. And they just put them with no explanation in these rooms. And then they'd see what happened because they'd say on the staff, they had no heating at this point. So that bill was gone for a while. They had no staff. The only people they had was they were standing behind the bar themselves and they'd sell cocktails and they'd sell simple cocktails and very few of them to make that simple as well. So they were taking a huge gamble. They were changing their concept entirely and thinking what would happen and what happened. It worked not just cheaper, but so much better. Mm -hmm. The third iteration very different from the two others. They came from immersive theater. They thought they were going to do immersive theater shows, which facilitated conversations. Then they thought the problem was they were lacking story and explanation. They tried that. Then they flipped that script completely, got rid of the theater, got rid of the, the show idea, and made it into not a bar, but a dead letter warehouse, a place you come to talk with people. Maybe you know them, maybe you don't. And you could also just hang out there and have a drink and then leave. And by changing that, they actually succeeded in doing what they wanted, which was create conversations between strangers. And they did it cheaper and they did it better. And they did it suddenly financially successfully. Mm -hmm. And they only did that because they came from a strong idea. They tested it. 
didn't work. Then they tested it in a different in a different way, but still the same idea. And then it didn't work. And then they got so desperate, they scratched the idea to its very core. And then they tried that again, not the immersive theater idea, but the idea of facilitating conversations in a simpler, cheaper format, because that's all they could afford. They were desperate. And then it not only worked, but it worked better. And I think the reason that story speaks to me, and these guys were really nice guys, so we got to ask questions behind the scenes, was that they were they were very honest about that journey. And they never lost sight of the goal, which was facilitating conversations and building a business off that. And they never lost sight of the story of the dead letter warehouse, but they completely changed how they used it. Yes. That spoke to me. And I, I think that many people out there, when they are doing something, whether they're, again, whether they're raising their kids or building a business or just exploring a friendship, they tend to get stuck in phase one or two. They try out what they've planned and then they try it out in a different way. And then when it still doesn't work, what they, most of us don't do is we don't do that complete pivot, but still within the core. What we instead do is we come up with iteration, not two, but three or four or five or six of what's essentially the same idea. What these guys did, what really amazed me, was they scratched off that idea and said, okay, let's have a new idea for the same goal, the same purpose, yes. but let's have it in a completely new packaging. And it turned out that was brilliant. And now they're expanding and looking for investors for more dead letter warehouses in more spaces. Incredible, incredible. This um, when I was in um, in Silicon Valley a few times, they say that the they always have this mindset of fail Ferrari fast, just as fast as you can. Realize that the business model isn't working, that you are either not explaining, you know, your uh, what you're about, what problem you're solving. People don't understand how to interact with you, or maybe you know your product really isn't that relevant to their lives. And there's either too much competition, or it's really truly completely irrelevant. Um, made me think about the book, uh, the Blue Ocean Strategy, which is just so powerful. The Cirque du Soleil example, where they said through a bit of market research, you were talking a little bit about getting those data points where you go, actually, let's look at what people are truly enjoying, why, you know, what's really sort of, you know, stimulating them, exciting them, and what are they not really truly excited about? So with Cirque du Soleil, it was all about the animals and the big talent, which were all very expensive. And they found out through research that actually people find it, you know, um, a bit cruel to the animals and they're not enjoying it and with the big stars actually it doesn't really matter because because they they're not coming for one person they're coming for for the way that the team is interacting and so that kind of feels like perhaps in a you know founders need to look into the product and and, and talk a little bit to their to their customers uh, how do you feel about research and sort of uh gathering some data points so first off, thank you for bringing up the Blue Ocean strategy and and that book. I when I I didn't get through it, but I read <laughs> enough of it that I got excited and felt okay. I I think I know where this is going. No, I love that, and I love the Cirque du Soleil example. And there's so many of them out there. The people have looked at okay, so here's a necessary component for what do you what you do right? And and for me actually, this this podcast was. An example of that, of course, it wasn't at that level. I'm not Cirque du Soleil, but I looked at, okay, I'd like to do a podcast because I like the podcast format. I like listing myself and I, I would like to do some of that. And I thought, okay, what should it be about? I asked, I asked my followers on LinkedIn, here are four formats that I would like to test out. Which of them appeals most to you? The one that got the most votes was this one live coaching conversation. So I thought, okay, I'll try that because even if not everybody loves it, at least there's some people who said, I want to see this. And then I sat down and I thought, and I discussed with some smart people, okay, what are the problems podcasts normally run into? Where does it normally go wrong? And one of the places it often goes wrong is somebody's excited, right? Somebody creates a podcast, they're excited, and then they're looking for numbers and they want it to grow, and then they don't hit their numbers. And then it's like, oh, okay, we wanted a thousand listeners or a million listeners or just 10 listeners, depending on ambition level. And it doesn't really work. And numbers are suddenly they had 2,000 listeners. And then the month after they have 1,500 per episode. And uh, it seems like a slog. And then they get delayed on episodes. And, and then this, then they get into the desperation phase where they change it completely or they just shut it down. Mm 
Yes. Right. That is a classic podcast journey. And I want to avoid that. And I said, okay, so what's the central problem here? What, what do I need to, which nut do I need to crack? And I looked at it from different angles and I realized that one of the nuts that was there for the cracking was the listeners. Mm -hmm. So I asked myself very simply, can I create a podcast that will work with zero listeners? Mm. Wow. Where most people in a podcast would say, a podcast with zero listeners is not really a podcast, Klaus. <laughs> I said, ah, well, try me. Mm. And then I figured out that if I could create a podcast that where I got to have coaching conversations with people, which I enjoy, so I'm happy, and people enjoy them, so they're happy, and both people went away, both me and the person on the coaching podcast would go away thinking, oh, that was actually time well spent. If I could do that, and there were people who were willing to be coached, and I was willing to do the coaching, and everybody had a good time, maybe even learned a thing or two, maybe even got inspired, and were now more connected, either new connections or strengthened ones, mm -hmm. then even if there's no listeners, it's still a success. The podcast is the excuse for the conversations, but it's not the goal of the conversations. And then if somebody listens, great, right? If there's 2 million listeners, great. If there's 20 listeners, great. But the listeners are not the goal. In fact, they're just an added bonus that may or may not be there. Mm -hmm. I thought, okay, if I do it that way, then listeners will never be a problem. Because if they're there, good. If they're not there, also good. As long as there are people there willing to have that conversation, that's you and me. And I thought, oh, okay, let's try this. And it means I don't know what my numbers are. Sure, I'd love to have 2 million listeners. Sure, let's not kid ourselves. That'd be great. Of course. <laughs> it's not necessary. Then it goes from being nice or from being necessary to being nice. And it means the podcast is not going to fail because of listener numbers. It may fail because I get tired of doing coaching for free. It may fail because nobody wants my coaching, whether it's free or not. Or it may fail because people don't want to have their stories shared or whatever. There can be plenty of failure points, but none of them are related to audience numbers. Mm, because that's an, a bonus to you, really. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's a bonus. It's not a necessity. It's a nice. It's not. It's a B. It's not an A. And I think that for many people, when they do, whether it's events or they build a business or, again, their relationships, the more you can reduce the amount of necessity to nice. Mm -hmm. right? when, I, when I've taught event design over the years, one of the first things I've always told people is when you look at events, there are essentially three categories for most things. There's A, which is necessary. If you don't have it, the event will fail or, or people will be very mad at you. Mm -hmm. Right. If it's a three day event and you've told people they have a bed to sleep in and they don't have one. Yes, it will work, but it's going to be it's going to be tricky. Right. Oh, there's no food. Taha, deal with it. That's going to be tricky. But those are the A's and the B's are the ones that are nice, but you can do without them. Yes, they'll be noticed, but they're not necessary. Mm -hmm. We said we'd have a great musician. Instead, we just have a musician. OK, well, it's not as good, but it can still work. And the C's are the ones where nobody will notice if they're not there. But if they are there, you might go, wow, that's really nice. Yes. Special guest acts or that origami figure on your bed when you go into your hotel room or like the, the stuff that's, oh, that, that extra touch. But it wasn't like you were missing it. And I find that amateur event organizers, amateur event designers, they tend to have a lot of A's, very few B's. And almost no C's because everything is seen like necessary for it to work. And the really hardcore veteran event organizers who've done it all, they're like, A, now that's a B. A, now that's a B. Oh, that's a C. And their lists look entirely different. And it doesn't mean that they do worse events. In fact, they usually do better. But it means that they make sure the necessary is done and done right. And then they worry less about the other stuff, but try to get it in there. So they don't stress about, oh my God, we need to have a web page that is brand coordinated with our PDF material that is brand coordinated with what we say in the sponsor talk. And if we don't have that, the baby will die. It's like, yeah, but it won't. Yeah. Yes, it's nice, especially if you're Coca-Cola, but let's be fair. It's not necessary. It's nice. If you can get to that, if you can find out what's nice, what's necessary, and what's an, an added extra and, and kind of move some of them down the line, then you have a much nicer life, both in your relationships and your business. And it won't mean you do it worse. It'll just mean you stress less. 
I have um, sort of a question related to that. I'm just mindful of the time, but you talk a lot about design and, you know, kind of leaning into the theme of what is necessary, what is, what's a must have versus a nice to have. Design is, you know, there are so many companies that we know and love, Apple and Airbnb, I would, I would argue that are really sort of a design led entity, you could see in their founders, they've got that sort of affiliation, a natural sort of inclination to want something to be very aesthetic. How do you view design? Um, what is the importance of design? And what advice would you give someone who doesn't have that natural inclination? Just a simple question, right? <laughs> just like a small one to round off with, just like an easy yes or no. So, Klaus, what do you have for breakfast? <laughs> First off, I'll answer that. Well, then we'll we'll round off this whole thing. I'll answer. It. First off, I think it's it's very important here to distinguish between design as visual aesthetics and and that sort of thing, the classic design, yes. and design of events, design of services, design of products. And I'm one of the worst people because I come from the realm of experience design where we essentially say everything at the end of the day is about human experience, at least the stuff we design for humans or even animal experience. And that means everything at the end of the day is under the umbrella of experience design. So you guys who do UX or you guys who do brand uh, visuals or you guys who do services, you're all part of our realm because as experience designers, we are kind of the top of the heap. It means we're also the most generalist. So when I talk about design, I don't necessarily talk about aesthetics. I talk about designing an event or designing an experience. And that includes, of course, design of aesthetics. It includes design of logistics. It includes design of everything, which is essentially just a fancy way of saying, thinking about the thing and making a plan for the thing. Yeah. But if you call yourself an experienced thinker and planner, that's really weird. So that's why experience design is a subject. So that's the first thing is, what do I mean by design? The second is, I think, and I'm going to get in trouble here, <laughs> that I think that aesthetic design is overrated, mm -hmm. but user design is underrated. And experience design, which encompasses both, is something that is deeply underrated, mm -hmm. right? It, it's very often when I go into somewhere, right? Whether it's a big company or a small one and they say, hey, Klaus, we'd like your skills as an experienced designer. It doesn't matter if it's helping remake a festival or rethink an airport, or it is finding out how to help a small company do marketing for their socks. Mm -hmm. First question is always, what does the experience look like of the people you're trying to serve? And it's often that answer isn't there. Mm -hmm. And and I have a beautiful example from a woman who was a guest at, at one of our College of Extraordinary Experience events, who said after she'd been involved in the new Berlin-Brandenburg airport. Mm -hmm. And there they had some, some proposals from different companies that said, okay, we can build this and here's what it can look like and what it can do. And she'd been to our event. She said, I didn't know about experience design. I don't think anybody I work with knows either. And now I'm sitting here. We were sitting at, at uh, the old Schönefeld Airport in Berlin. And we were talking about this. She said, now I can't help but think that this is the most important thing for an airport. And we said, well, we, we kind of agree. And she said, yeah, but nobody's discussing this. The proposals we're looking at all talk about how many LED lights and how many meters of cables and how many toilets and how many gates and how many detail uh, square meters of detail uh, retail space that sort of thing nobody talks about the experience wow and she was saying and i i realized this is the most important thing yes so part of my thoughts on design are that if you think design is just aesthetics yes. well that's important but if you don't think about experience or about logistics or about service or about what, what are you doing about, about the product, then you're going to run into the problem that is you're looking at the wrong thing. You're solving the wrong problem. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to exemplify that. And then we're going to round off is, and this is not my quote. This is, this is not even my story. It's from the Austrian School of Economics. And I'm pretty sure it's attributed to one of their superstars, Ludwig van Mises. And for those of you out there, 
who are not familiar with the Austrian school of economics, which some of you might not have been completely up to date on. The story is sort of like this, is that imagine a restaurant, and in that restaurant, there is a Michelin star chef. They do amazing food, and in comes this couple, and they order food, and they sit down, and they have a meal, and they eat, and the food is amazing. And then the, the owner comes out, and he said, how, how did you like it? They say, well, I mean, we really had a good time, and it was great. It's a lovely restaurant, but it... Uh, we feel that big pile of horse manure next to the table is kind of a problem because next to the table is a big pile of horse shit for non-explained reasons. And here most people go, what? what? Why is there horse shit there? And then, of course, the owner listens and says, oh, I'm so sorry. I wish that that you had a better experience. They say, well, but we really liked it, but we're we're not sure we'll recommend it. And, and they go out and he thinks, this is terrible. And he goes out and he fires the chef. Yes. <laughs> because if you're only measuring the chef, then it's easy to lose sight of the horse manure in the restaurant. And of course, the guests know the problem isn't the chef. The food was brilliant. The problem is the horse manure. But the owner listens to them and they even tell him, yeah, the, the horse manure kind of got in the way. But he's just thinking, oh, I have a restaurant. A restaurant is about how good the chef is. If they're not happy, I must fire the chef. And this situation, while, while comical, the example that we see that over and over and over again, mm -hmm. that people don't measure everything, of course. In fact, they tend to measure a lot of what's unnecessary and not necessarily what is. And then they look at that and then they look at the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And then when the answer isn't in those things, then they try to make it that way. right? And again, if you're only looking at the chef, then of course you fire the chef. If nobody's looking at the horse manure, and you don't have a good system for actually listening to your customers when they say, you know, it stunk a bit. Mm -hmm. Then you're thinking, oh, we need a better chef. Yes. I I don't know if you've read the book Unreasonable Hospitality, but it was it is one of the best books I've ever written by the guy, the restauranteur of um of like the number one restaurant in the world in New York. Um, and I just took away so so much of what you you know you were just saying he also resonate you know kind of talks about really listening and really uh, paying attention he's got this one story where you know he had this like group of foodies and they were you know having a great meal at his restaurant they were saying oh it's fantastic we ate at all the best restaurants all over new york but we still didn't get a, a, what they call it a water hog i think which is a hot dog and he over heard them, ran down the street to a cart, a hot dog cart, the best one around, brought it back to the chef, had to convince the chef to actually serve it. The chef was obviously outraged, but they put a nice little, you know, mustard and a bit of the, the you know, sort of um, the classic ketchup, you know, New York serving and he brought it to the table and they really lost <laughs> they they lost their marbles they loved it so much and, and that's what you're talking about it's really seeing the person the human being looking to connect looking to be excited looking to have uh, an opportunity to you know to enjoy a meal uh between friends and 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 that's i suppose what you also are very mindful when you're designing events and you're thinking about the actual user experience. So thank you so much for sharing that. I, I try, right? At least, and then I, of course, I fail all the time, but I try. And I think that the reason we don't do that is that when we're small, we don't like to hear that somebody wants us to change something, especially if it's something we don't want to change. And when we're big, the idea that sitting down with one person and having an, a deep conversation might actually change a business is, is to many people laughable because we have all these numbers, right? You mentioned you've been at Meta and that means business is done in the billions. It's done in the hundreds of millions and a small test is like, let's test it on 10 million people. Yes. <laughs> right? And, and in that environment, I don't think that very many people are willing to say, I don't know, the good old Zuckerberg, I don't know his thinking, but I don't think that when you're in that environment where the numbers are so big and data is so ready available that anybody will have the guts to say, you know what I think would actually be good? I think I'm going to talk to Jack. Jack's a friend. He's been on here for a while. I'm just going to sit down. We're going to have a two-hour conversation, and we're going to see where it leads. And maybe out of that, Jack will say something that will make us make a radical change to a big thing 
in our business. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's happening. What's happening instead is here's an idea. Let's test it on 100 million people and we get aggregates. But 100 million people having deep conversations with them is not easy. Getting statistical numbers from them, super easy. But getting that deep listening, yeah. right? That's tricky. Yeah. And, and deep listening from 10 people will often get you, in my experience, will get you further than numbers from a million people. Totally. But that's scary. It's scary and it's hard to defend and it takes vision and courage and somebody to say, you know what? I'm not going to listen to the million people we asked. I'm going to listen to the 10 I actually talked with. Yes. And you know what? I might be wrong. Mm. That's a scary, scary proposition. Right? Yes. You need a level of humility, I suspect, as well. And uh, being open to knowing that you don't know everything, oh, which is not easy. Yeah, and... and and we get worse at that as we get better and older. Yes. And especially as we get more successful, of course, all of us. Now, a level of humility is a good place to round off. Yes. And I'm going to do two things here at the end. Uh, one is I'm going to thank you. Normally, I thank people for bringing their challenges to me because that takes courage to share and vulnerability. And that's really generous of people. Here, I'm going to thank you for something else. Thank you for for giving me a chance to talk a little bit more generally instead of trying to fix a specific problem you came with. I enjoy doing the other thing, but I also really enjoy doing this. So thank you for giving me that gift. That is very much appreciated. The second part is I want you to think of three things you take away from our conversation. Three, maybe it's something you agree with, maybe it's something you disagree with, maybe it's something that made you angry, maybe it's something that'll just stick in your mind for a while. Three things you take away from this and share them. I, honestly, I wrote down so many things. I found our conversation so inspiring and I learned so much. And I have to say, you know, your experience shows, but it still feels like you are very much sort of open to to, to continue learning and, and growing, which I think is probably what makes you so successful and, and so great to speak with. I love this idea of, of like, you know, being very simple, you talked a lot about simplifying, you know, the stupid solutions. I, I love that. I think, you know, keep it, keep it clear, keep it, <laughs> you know, look at the basic things. Sometimes they're overlooked and people are trying to do, you know, the big kind of, you know, show piece stoppers when you really need to get sort of everything, you, you know, sort of the simple ones out of the way. I love this idea that, that you We'll figure it out as well. You know, you don't have to know everything straight off the bat. Like I, I, I really resonate with that because I've seen founders crippled by problems that are so down the road, <laughs> miles and miles away from. Okay, boss, when we get to ten million users, we'll think about how to accommodate, you know, everyone. But, but that's that's very true. I, 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 you know get on it, work it, figure it out, have confidence that you'll be all right. And then uh, I, I think I think the story bit is so important from, from the dead letters. You know, it really is about understanding what the core mission is, what you, what your essence is, and how do you really tell it again in a very simple, straightforward way. You know, it, I think it connects to this idea that you'll figure it out because so many founders have so many things they want to talk about, you know, and we do this and we do this. And I always ask, well, what's a USP? And they're like, they give me six USPs. And I'm like, you realize it's just the one. So I, I love that. The clarity on what people love about us, what they connect with on a human level, where they put their money, where their mouth is, is so, is, is so important as well. Um, and, and, and yeah, and then I think at the end of the day, just being human, listening and, and being a bit, you know, humble, knowing that you don't know anything, everything, but you're willing to learn and put yourself out there. Uh, I love your podcast. Thank you so much for having me on, on your show. I, I look forward to connecting again. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. And, and thank you for those last words as well. No, very much appreciated. And thanks for the talk. To all of you out there, our listeners, our flies on the wall, whether you are thousands or millions, we don't know. But however many you are, whoever you are, thank you for listening. This has been the Innovation Coaching Podcast. You've heard me, Klaus Hostel, your host, and you've heard Noah Deckel. Thank you.